welcome to the GoTo Podcast. Each episode covers the brightest and boldest ideas from the world's leading experts in software development. Tune in for practical lessons, compelling theories, and plenty of inspiration. GoTo gathers the brightest minds in the software community to help developers tackle projects today, plan for tomorrow, and create a better future. Stay up to date with the latest in tech through GoTo's top-rated events held online and in person in cities like Amsterdam, London, Copenhagen, and Chicago, and by subscribing to the GoTo Conference's YouTube channel, where you can find thousands more high-quality dev talks. Learn more at gotopia.tech. So hello, and welcome to this episode of the GoTo Podcast. I'm Charles Hummel. I'm a freelance techie editor, author, and consultant. And this is the fourth episode in a mini series of podcasts that I'm doing for GoTo, talking to software engineering leaders. I'm aiming for each episode to have actionable insights and suggestions for further research, such as books and papers to read, conference talks to watch, and so on. When I was working at Container Solutions, I hosted a podcast called Hacking the Org and interviewed Adrian Cockcroft, amongst others. And in the course of my conversation with Adrian, he asked if I'd read The Value Flywheel Effect. I hadn't, but I went out and bought it and read it on the strength of his recommendation. And I'm really glad I did because it's honestly one of the best textbooks I've read in years. So to pass on that favor, if you haven't read it, I really recommend you do. And I'm thrilled to have one of the co-authors, David Anderson, on the show today. David has been at the leading edge of the technology industry for 25 years. He formed the serverless edge and continues to work with clients and partners to prove out the thinking in the Value Flywheel the Phone book. The book is largely based on his experience at Liberty LIT, where he worked for 14 years, including seven as director of technology. He is now an architect at GP, Globalization Partners, and is also a member of the Wardley Mapping community. David, welcome to the show. Thank you, Charles. Great to be here. It's wonderful to have you on. So can you give us a sense of the size of the team you have within Liberty IT in Belfast and your position within that and maybe the role your team played more widely within the company? Yeah, that's a great question. We we're probably officially we were architects, you know, as the director of technology or sort of CTO. So Liberty IT in Belfast, it's a, a kind of a software engineering specialty kind of department of Liberty Mutual, the Fortune 100 insurance company. So um, there's maybe like a six, seven thousand person IT department within Liberty Mutual. And probably 10 percent of that is in, in kind of Belfast and in Ireland. So my role was always like the, the technical leader, like the, the CTO of the organization. So I had a small architecture team, maybe around between usually 12 to 14 architects. And uh, really we worked across all the leading edge projects in the Liberty Mutual enterprise globally. So we were always at the cutting edge of whatever big advancement was kind of happening. And it was like, probably the role we played was well, probably kind of cattle wrangling, you know, is. How do we drive change and ensure the best practice? And, you know, and it's very much a, not, I would say, an ivory tower architect, but more like enabling architect. We, we, I based the model on Gregor Holtz, the elevator architect, that we could, we could go down in with the teams, sit shoulder to shoulder and build with them, or pop into the executive team and explain why a certain direction is important and every floor in between. So that was really important, not only having the sensing engine, the recognized change in the organization, but having the, the experience to shape that change and then the skills to make it real within the teams. So um, lucky enough that we were in that position and it was a brilliant experience. Yeah. And Liberty moves the cloud around 2013. I think that was the catalyst for you starting to think about how you could build software differently. So can you talk about that? What were some of the things that were influencing you and how did you settle on the serverless first approach you ended up taking? We, we had experimented in, you know, private cloud, versus cloud, all the other, all the various variations, if you remember like back, back 15 years ago. And around 2013, 2014, we actually sat down with AWS and said, okay, we're going to, we're going to do this serious now for public cloud. And I was lucky enough to be at that table as one of the technical leaders at, from yeah, an enterprise perspective. And my peers were like network specialists, security specialists, and I was the only real software guy. And it struck me that we need to build differently. We can't keep doing what we've been doing because this is a complete paradigm shift. So I, I, we, we, my, one of my peers, a guy called Ed Carmody, used to always say, reduce undifferentiated heavy lifting. Like, what do we not need to do? So that was something that we kind of stuck and, you know, that's how we need to think. 
So we start thinking about how can we offload work to the, the the vendor, not just compute, like a whole bunch of stuff. How can we make them, you know, give us building blocks that, that we can move faster? So we started to experiment with everything that was around at the time. And we were lucky enough to be at reInvent when Lambda was launched. And that idea of serverless <clears throat> was just a game changer. So there was a lot of thinking at that time, 2015, 2016, around serverless first and starting at that technology and working your way back to containers and back to other technologies. I mean, there's no point where like a team would write a logging service and it's like, we're an insurance company. What are you writing a logging service for? Let's just use something else. So trying to get builders not to build was really the, 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 the goal. And let's be high up in the value stream, build systems for our business, for the, the present of our business and not worry about building lower level components that we're not good at. So that was really the, the catalyst. And then what we really did was start experimenting and getting quick wins and flesh it because the technology was very early back in 14, 15. So really trying to understand how it worked. So there's probably two things going on, understanding the technology and then convincing our peers that we can actually build software differently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did you come to write the book with IT revolution? I assume you had a meeting with Gene Kim at some point. How did that go? <laughs> that was funny. Well, you know, serverless was still very kind of funny and, and um, the whole idea of serverless first is still not very well understood. It's, it's not just about functions and Lambda. It's just about the higher plane of how you write software. So I, we fleshed out and kind of worked out this way of working, which, which, which was starting to really get results. Like we had things where we would take a, a, a $20 uh, piece of work and then reduce to four cent. So there's massive cost reductions, massive speed. So we'd be doing this and driving massive whole scale change within the mutual for several years. And then it was actually Adrian Cockcroft, as you mentioned at the start of the, 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 the conversation. I met him, um, a few years ago and we, um, I was kind of sharing with him. The, um, that what we were doing, this was our kind of playbook, our, our approach. And I thought, I mean, I have massive respect for Adrian. I, I was I was looking for some constructive criticism and he said, wow, he said, that's really impressive. And I almost fell off my chair. And, uh, <laughs> so we started working. He was like, I want to understand how you did this at a 100 year old insurance company. So we spent a lot of time working with him and became good friends. And then, uh, he said to me, so you, 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 when I moved on from Liberty, he said, you have to write a book. I was like, oh, right, it's okay. I had no intention. So I, I, I started writing and he says, like, hey, this is pretty good. You should keep going. So he connected me with a few publishers and I met Gene Kim. And I was always a massive fan of IT Revolution for many years. I used to go to their, um, the, the DevOps uh, Enterprise Summit. And then I was thinking, okay, going to the, like the father of DevOps, Gene Kim, and saying, okay, well, the serverless thing, we don't need a bunch of, you know, the lower level stuff. But, the, the first thing he says was, I don't think this is for us. And he says, but the wordly mapping thing is interesting. And so he says, he says, I'd love to do a wordly map someday. And I was like, okay, was it, why, why don't we do one now? We were sitting in the Zoom call. So I mapped out his strategy for the Enterprise Summit and gave him a couple of key learnings and helped him understand. And he just went, wow, you know, the genie went, holy cow. He says, you've just encapsulated my entire, everything in my brain. In a single diagram in 20 minutes, he says, that's incredible. So and right there on the spot, he says, we got to publish this book because this technique is too important. This way of thinking is too important. So then we started a brilliant partnership with IT Revolution and it's such a good company. There's such a brilliant amount of learning. Uh, and what they kind of say is they go to practitioners and help them write books as opposed to going to authors, publishing books. So I thought that was perfect. And they, um, such a good body of work. I mean, it's almost like an MBA in their in their back history of books by themselves. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I think I think they're phenomenal, and I love that story. Actually, I'm I'm um, also a huge fan of worldly mapping, and it's something I used quite a bit when I was at uh, C4 Media when I was Infocom's chief editor. Found it incredibly helpful, but I also found it's really hard to get across to people kind of how it works and why it works. I'm really, I think from my experience, the only way you can really do that is to sit down and map with people. And then at some point, hopefully they kind of get it. And actually I've heard Adrian Cockcroft use music as an, as an analogy. So like, you know, most people can listen to music and enjoy it, but to actually compose music, you need to study forms and patterns and, and learn the language of it, which I rather liked as a, as a comparison. Do you think that's a useful analogy actually? 
No, I think it's 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 really good because there's there's almost like a there's like an abstract level of thought, which is composition and music theory that you need to understand. You know, you can appreciate music, but you need that music theory to really understand it. And I think it's the the same around worldly mapping and even technology. You've got to understand the the abstractions and the principles to really create. And I think, and Simon, like I'm a huge fan of Simon, I, I, I speak to him regularly. Um, speaking to him yesterday, actually, um, he's just thinking he's completely meta in how he thinks about it and the, the map, worldly mapping technique. And again, if anyone hasn't hasn't heard of it, it's it's basically you draw a value chain of like starting from the cost the, the the customer and all their kind of needs with dependencies, and then there's a evolutionary axis of um, genesis, custom product, and commodity. And like every single component will evolve through that cycle and even they distill like that abstract thinking so so cleanly so when you start to map out the value chain in your organization in your tech stack even in you know in your in your um in your industry the the actual market you start to see what's the thing that you should be building and what's the thing that you should just rent having that clarity that sense making is absolutely critical and i mean that that's we started using that technique again, probably around 13 and 14. And that helped us build the awareness around what should be buy and what should be build. Uh, cause it wasn't clear at the time, you know, but, um, and really understanding what's the value proposition of this team or this organization. And let's double down on that. So it's, it's, it's such an important, um, technique. I, the way I think of it is like sense making. It's making sense of something complicated. Do you think the fact that you were all practicing architects was relevant to how you approached the problem, the problems you were trying to solve at Liberty? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think we were open to new ideas. The way I started the team, we were all architects as peers at the start. So we all knew each other. We had a good relationship. So there was no kind of real egos. We were, and we spent a lot of like flat team that we would just get on a white, get on a whiteboard, get in the room and we would talk about things. So we were never afraid to start whiteboarding and exchange ideas. We were always a fan of a, a different, a frameworks are important. You shouldn't blindly follow frameworks, but they give you new prompts and new ways of thinking. So we very much embraced the openness of these things. So we spent a lot of time just thinking about orderly mapping and drawing very bad maps. But again, it was the conversation was more important and that that good atmosphere between us were able to get creative and there was no fear of saying something stupid. I would often say something stupid, but, you know, so I think that sort of um, courage, openness and ability to think abstractly and put your ideas out there really helped. I think I've had it been in a management team with everyone having their own organizations. We wouldn't have got to that same um, that that same level. You know, because, you know, there's a different dynamic in those type of teams. Yeah. And actually, I think it's worth saying, certainly in my experience of mapping, the the business of doing the map is much more valuable than the map itself. That's to say, the process and what you get out of the process is more valuable than the piece of paper or the whiteboard at the end of it, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Because what it does is it, it, it clarifies your thinking. And it exposes maybe things that you, like a bias, if you had a bias where you maybe thought something wasn't important, you could actually explore that and, and gain understanding. And what we started doing, because it's very hard if you spend a couple of days working on a map and then you go to an executive and you show them the map, they're like, what's this, what are you showing me? But, so we would often take the observation from the map and say, like, distill in the bullet points. So you say, here's three bullet points of things that we should do. They go, ah, what? That's, wow, that sounds good. And they would say, well, how did you come to that? Or can you tell me more about this? So you're prepared for the conversation, the, the executive challenge, or why we should we do that? So it's like you've done your homework, but you're not showing your work or not. You know, so it was, it was, uh, it's a very important technique. So yeah, absolutely. The, the mapping is, as I say, the, the, the activity is much more important than the outcome. Yeah, yeah. And then in terms of the sort of overall key idea of the book itself, I think it's really about how you bring business and IT strategy together in what's a very large legacy company. Is that right? Would you would you kind of agree with that as a one line summary? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's I think that's fair. I mean, that idea of joining business technology, I, I was always struck by the the phrase the business 
and used to really annoy me because it's like we are employees, we are the business. Like there is no business. It's it's let's understand the company mission and let's make it happen. You know, IT does not have a a, a special dispensation to be separate from the company. You know, we we all have a badge. So I think that idea of um, having a single strategy, because I, I often heard, um, Liberty was very good at this. When you talk to very senior business people, they would say, I don't really care what you do under the hood. I just want to protect policyholders. That's it. You know, so when you have a really strong mission like that, you can then think about what can we do? And then you translate that. So that means maybe a faster quote or a faster response or, you know, we equate that in the non-functional requirements, but you're not going to get the head of the business telling you you need to have an SLO of 200 milliseconds. You know, you need to work out yourself or you translate the the business goal to the technology goal. So yeah. it's the same picture. I think it's such, I think it's actually, it sounds really obvious, but I actually think it's a really key insight. And the fact that it goes both ways, as it were. I mean, I have loads of conversations in my consulting jobs with, you know, I see people saying, oh, I can't get the business to sponsor me to pay down technical debt or something. And you're like, well, of course you can't. I have no idea what that means. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you can relate that to something, to something that actually affects a business outcome, then they're much more, you know, you're much more likely to get someone who isn't an IT person to sponsor you. Um, and so having some understanding of the business and how it works and your role within it, I think is absolutely key. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, and I think the, the CEO at the time was at Liberty Mutual, uh, James McLeod, he was very good bringing together different parts of the organization. You know, and it's like, like Nicole Forge Green says in, in Accelerate, it's like, you know, IT is not a cost center. And so it's a, it's a, it's a, a creation of value. That's a super important concept. Um, yeah, 100%. Can you talk about the, so you have four phases in your value flywheel. The, the flywheel itself, I think, is is broadly from the Jim Collins Good to yes. Great book, right? Um, that's certainly where I first came across it. And you have your four phases. So you have, you know, clarity, clarity slash purpose and so on. Can you talk about those four phases and kind of why you have them and how, they, how that works? <clears throat> yeah, one of the things that used to always um, slightly frustrate me is that you get the Gantt chart. Of the, the, we're going to start and we'll keep going and then we're done. And the, the thing that struck me about serverless, and there was a guy called Sheen Brasillas from Lego, talked about serverless being a rocket ship. Is once you get on this rocket ship, you never get off. It's like software is continuous. You know, it, it never really, once you invest and you invest in software, it, you, you got to, you got to keep working on it. So I always liked the idea of the flywheel effect by Jim Collins. I think it's, it's, it's a, such a good model. It's a much better way of thinking about technology. So I started to think re retrospectively, I started to think about how did we drive this change in Liberty? Such a huge change going from, you know, like a huge amount of success stories. And if you're interested, it would Google Liberty Mutual Serverless, Google those three words and you'll see a whole raft of talks and, 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 and articles about, about the things that we did. Mm -hmm. Um, and really the four phases that I distilled down to join business technology strategy was first clarity of purpose. Like the teams must have clarity of purpose. Don't hand a ticket to the engineers and say, build this. Explain to the engineers why we're building this. Like what is the North Star metric? Every company has a North, you should have a North Star for a product. What's the thing that makes it successful? Make sure your engineers understand that and, you know, really help them, you know, obsess over time the value. And, and, and understand what's the competitive advantage in the market. Like, what are we trying to do as a company? Don't, don't lock them in the basement as IT department. So that's clarity of purpose. The second one is the challenge, right? You've got to create the environment of success. And this is really about psychological safety and the, the socio technical element of software. You know, don't just draw an art chart with four teams, expect them to go. This is very much in the DevOps kind of mindset. Um, you know, we're actually building a system here. And the system contains software and people and teams. So think about that in its entirety and how your software will help that system. And, you know, have the, the environment that you can raise your hand and say, I'm really not happy about how this is working, or I think there's a problem here. You encourage that, that, that safety. So that's that idea of ch and challenge being not in, a, in, a, in an aggressive way. You should be able to challenge the thinking. And challenge the thinking is always welcome. Because you know you might be right, you might be wrong. It doesn't matter. But you're ask, you're asking the question. The third phase is next best action. What can we do to create value quickly? So this is the whole idea of the code is a liability. 
She, you can't say that this is our goal. Here's the environment. Now we're going to disappear for 18 months and write a million lines of code. That's not helping. You don't need to do that. So with code as a liability and the serverless first mindset, you know, how can we quickly pull in together some cloud public cloud services to actually write capability very quickly? And in order to do that in an organization, you need a frictionless developer experience. You may be an internal developer portal where people can just grab a template, scaffold something, and have an API up and running in a matter of hours or days. That's where we need to get to. We have the capability to do that now in the industry. We can build APIs uh, components really quickly. Let's do that. Let's build quickly and learn. That's that idea of, of, of next best action. What can we do quickly to, to prove the value? And then the fourth phase is long-term value. <clears throat> so long-term value is based on the, the well-architected framework. So all three cloud providers, um, AWS, Azure and Google have a version of well architectures where they say from all our solution architects, these are the best practices in architecture. And I would probably bias because I've been using the, the AWS one for almost 10 years. So they have six pillars, which is uh, security, cost, operational excellence, reliability, performance, and sustainability. You can actually have an opinion of what does good look like. The architecture isn't, it isn't what someone thinks is nice. There's a very strict list of non-functional requirements that you need to meet. Decide what they are and use the architecture framework as a, as a common language in your organization to say, this is our expectation for performance. It's black and white. It's not an, opinion. It's not a, 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 an idea. It's very clear. So it's also about keeping a, and if you do follow a service first mindset, you can actually keep, write very sustainable software. You can keep a very low carbon footprint, which is a nice way to um, think about efficiency and writing good solid software. And that's that kind of flavor effect. And then you're back to once you're starting to, you know, have that ability to write good software in a very efficient manner. Then when someone says, well, we have a North Star about X, you can hit that very quickly. So it's about moving at pace. An idea that, and as you're at the flywheel, where it really comes in is you're spotting inertia points where there's maybe a problem with, you know, the, the security process, with infrastructure, with, you know, the business aren't invested in the technology team. The engineers don't have the skills. You'll start to spot an inertia. And you can say, okay, you know, we have a problem here with our um, security scanning. How do we need to improve that? And don't do it to security. You'll sit down with the security team and say, we need to improve this. And we'll say, yes, we do. <laughs> so it's kind of like in a collaborative environment, you start to spot the inertia and then try and fix it. So it's kind of, you know, break down the silos and move at pace. So this is what we did in Liberty for many years and traveled at extreme pace, I would say. You know, yeah, I want to pick that up in a sec. But I also just quickly wanted to pull out, because you use the, the code, is, code is a liability thing. Um, and that, that was a kind of a, a key light bulb sort of insight for me there, which is this idea of having something like a simple motto. So, you know, code is a liability or improving time to value or something like that. Are you saying in the book that that can be much more effective as a way of keeping engineers moving than, you know, a 55-minute town hall with the with a boring presentation. And I just thought that's a really, it's not something I've seen sort of articulated before. It's not sort of particularly earth shattering, but it's, it's somehow, I don't know, it's just one of those things that I really, that sort of really connected for me. And I think it's such a, I just think it's such a useful insight. This is really worth, this idea of mottos, I think is really worth drawing out. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, and there are, you sometimes find slogans in the, in the, in the corporate world that don't mean anything. Um, oh, yes. I, I always liked, I always loved, there was a book I read many years ago about enterprise architecture principles, and the idea of principle-driven development, <clears throat> that have the principles to help people understand. It's like, can you read my white paper or just learn these three words? So the idea of, and I, I always thought this was, a, this was a brilliant way to communicate thinking. Uh, and then I started the, when I started to work more with Amazon, I understood their, their leadership principles and the idea of their tenants. And they, they actually have a, they describe how they write a tenant. So something like, um, like disagree and commit. So disagree and commit is, and then it's like, you know, that the fact that when something happens, you can disagree, you have the conversation, but once you agree to progress something, then that's where we're going to commit to it. So that's such a disagree and commit is such a simple principle. First thing big. You know, so they will need to distill these very complicated ideas down to a few words, explain them, and then actually use them. So code as a liability was something, and it was mind-blowing for many engineers. And I had many conversations where people say, 
my job is the right code. Are you telling me not the right code? I would say, your job is not the right code. Our job is to solve business problems. We same thing. No, it's not the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it led to, you know, polite. That, that would describe that as a challenge. That's two people having a conversation, no respectfully. And you're and you, you get to where you get to, but it's a way of like I've had many, many conversations like this where you help people understand. Yeah, you know, like why, why, why you're here, basically, in, in your organization, uh, on what's important. But it's really interesting that I mean, you you were saying at the, you said it right at the beginning. You're kind of asking builders not to build, or not to build as much. And I, I just, it's it's one of those things. You'll say, I think you're so used as a programmer to thinking that your value is essentially in the amount of code that you write. Yeah, um, and it's a real, it's a very important mind shift, I think. <clears throat> but it's as old, it's as old as the hills. I mean, like I. I been looking at software engineering for, for decades and would often look back at old books. I think it's fascinating figuring out what were the books that were written 50 years ago. And if you, you hear people like, um, like people joining companies in the early 80s where there was incentives for lines of code written and yeah. then someone comes in and refactors it and they've, their, 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 their success criteria for the week is like minus a thousand lines of code. <laughs> so it's <laughs> like, you know, th- this was happening in the 80s. So yes. these these concepts are not new. They're just we're, we just have to we forget them because we think the technology changes. The principle no longer applies. The principles are are evergreen. It's right. the language technology that changes. Yeah, yeah. I think the thing that really blew me away reading the book was just the speed at which your team was able to do things. It's much much faster than you know anything I've seen anywhere else. And part of what I found interesting about that is because you're a very large organization, so you have so many groups. So, you know, in my world, that might be I might have Java EE people and I might have Cloud Foundry people and so on and so on. So even just getting everyone on board with we're now doing AWS and Lambda, you know, how do you do that? It's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> At least in the book, you can, uh, you, can, you can write a paragraph that describes four years of pain. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think for me, the secret is good, like engineering excellence or high performing engineering. You want really good engineers who understand how to write software. You have that open mind. So, you know, you're not, your, your identity isn't the language that you use. Your, your, your pride is engineering. So I think that really helped. I think the, and I'm be biased here and I'm, I'm located in Belfast and we're in Ireland. We have a lot of really strong engineers and people who will, will both think in the right way. So I think having the value of, really strong software engineer. And I don't want to think that I'm saying we don't code. Code is really important. It's really, it's critically important that we write code, but the right code is more important. So having that mindset. So I think when you are working with real engineers who will think about the business problem and, and what we're trying to achieve, then you can move with pace. Because when a, techni- a technological improvement comes along, they get it. They go, okay, so if I do that, instead of writing like, you know, um, 2000 lines. I can now write this in like in 20 lines. Okay. I see the, I, I see the, the, the improvement there. So, um, so good engineers was important, but also, I mean, it's a show, don't tell. It's very hard to preach from your ivory tower and say, we should do this. But when you, like we, we had projects where somebody would, there was one project in particular that a, a team, one of the guys had taken a piece of work in January to write a piece of, write a product for August because there was a, there was a, um, a, a regulation target that they had to hit and they would solve it with software. So he says, let's do this with serverless first using their approach. And they were finished by May. So they were actually finished like three or four months early. So the team were like, we're done now. Well, like that's us finished. And I said, well, okay, now we get into well architected. Let's secure it. Let's reduce the cost. Let's optimize it. So by the time the, let's improve the design user experience. So that, so building the thing quickly gives you then time to test and learn and improve some of the non-functional stuff. So by the time that regulation hit in August, the team were like well ahead of their brief and the, the business stakeholders were delighted, like expectations completely blown away. So that just was happening time and time again. And then you start to get to this uh, environment where people talk about, wow, they did this, is this new way of doing things that's really fast or not really fast, but just it's generally better. Um, you know, then you start to get that, that, you know, the, the, the flyby starts to turn, you go to the inertia. So, um, it, it took a long time. 
I was curious as well about how you found dealing with some of the enabling teams, you know, like the security team, say, or the audit team, because again, in my consulting work and other experiences I've had, I found that those sorts of folks can be a particular challenge to kind of get on board with, with a change like this. Mm. Um, well, the first thing is, I, I would say to people is that security people are actually human beings. <laughs> <laughs> Want to talk to them and, and understand what they're trying to do. And I'd spend a lot of time working in cybersecurity and with audit teams. And, um, and I say with purposely. Um, you know, because you understand what are the controls and you understand the process that you're having to deal with is an implementation of a control. So if you can go and understand what's the control, maybe you can help the team create a better process. Like a, a brilliant example was um, I did a lot of work. I At one point, I was the secure development kind of lead for all of Liberty Mutual, like the global lead for secure development and, um, many years ago. And we had a control or a process around code reviews for secure development, but we, we evolved out the threat modeling because threat modeling was, was a bit higher quality and it met the control much better than the code review. So just working with the team, like the audit team at Liberty, we actually taught them the well architect the process. I said, instead of coming up with a list of questions, why don't you ask these questions from AWS that are just as good? So it's, you know, go to the team, understand their control and help them design a process that's a better fit for development teams and engineering teams. Because the, no one's happy if it's a bad process. We're not meeting the control well. The teams, there's friction. You know, there's still, there may still be issues with audit or with security. So if you understand kind of both sides of the fence, then you can design a better process with more automation or more quality, whatever. So certainly working, working with the teams to help them create a better process to meet the control. So I think that's, that's the only way to do that. If you clash with these enabling teams, Forget about it. End of story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the part of the point of the flywheel is, is, is to try and build up momentum. So how did you build momentum at Liberty? Well, um, we were kind of lucky, I think, in the sense that um, around, I think it was around 2016, there was a big change in the organization. Uh, again, I talked about the CEO at the time, wrote a, a technology manifesto. Because we, we, there was three changes that happened at the same time. The move to the cloud, the move to kind of customer-centric, you know, kind of design thinking and, and being like customer centricity, and then like full-scale agile, agile across the board. So though we, we we did those three changes at the same time, which if they looking back, maybe it wasn't a good idea. It it, it, <laughs> it was successful, but it was it was an interesting year or two. So there was an appetite for change. So sometimes, I mean, I'll, I'll certainly will not claim that the service first changed the entire company. It, there was many, many people driving a big, but there was a, there was an air of change. You know, there was an air of transformation. So that, that, that's always a good time to, I think, and if someone asked me this, I got asked this question yesterday, like, how do you drive change? A lot of it's about timing. So what I'll find is I'll have lots of different ideas of things we can improve. But sometimes you'll see that, okay, there's not an appetite to make this improvement. I have a, I have an approach for that. So I would always be, think about, you know, what are the potential changes? So we were really lucky in the sense that as we were working out this service first way of working, that, that, that kind of environment of transformation was there. And it was, a, it was a good time to kind of, you know, I wouldn't say create the momentum, but kind of, kind of jump on with, with the, uh, take advantage of the momentum. Yeah. I think that's, again, I think that's really interesting, actually. And I think, I think it's spot on that timing and, 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 and appetite for change is absolutely key. And being able to identify this is one of those moments where, where we can make change because you can't always for, for all kinds of reasons. We should talk about the cloud development kit and the building blocks you use. Why was that so impactful? It, one of the, again, I say it was an inertia point. One of the early inertia points we had with, with an AWS was the idea of cloud formation. You know, we talked about infrastructure as code. Um, we, like, I often think with enabling constraints. So one of the enabling constraints that we designed at Liberty was that every single change going to the public cloud would be infrastructure as code. So in order to do that, we disabled the AWS console. So you, you, you physically couldn't get access to the console. You could in a sandbox, but once you went into a 
a dev environment, not even production, a dev environment, everything was automated. Sure. So that was an enabling constraint because that was, you know, that's repeatability that I would say that's good kind of DevOps kind of practice. Um, but then it's quite a, it's a massive kind of learning curve to learn cloud formation. And even the um, sharing cloud from reusing cloud formation is not, it's, it, it doesn't, it's not, it's not great. It's a bit better now, but at the time it was, it was quite painful. So CDK gave us a nice abstraction and we'd always thought about what are the right abstractions that we need. You give me an API versus give me a bunch of code that I can use. So CDK was able to give us some core kind of architectural patterns that we could give to teams <clears throat> and say, here's a pattern for standing up an API. And the more importantly, I mean, this was before before Backstage. Uh, we, we had the need to write an internal developer portal. So effectively, early days of platform engineering. So we, we had a few failed attempts. First of all, we were very opinionated and we said, this is exactly how all the software should look. Developers said, no, I don't agree with that. <laughs> so that is. Then we had a team saying, let's build a front, let's build an abstraction around the cloud. Nope, it's not going to work. We're not fast enough. So then what we ended up doing was with CDK, it gave us uh, a language to create, create reusable patterns. And then we had a, like an internal developer uh, portal called um, the software accelerator that people could publish their patterns and that other people could use them. And if they didn't work, they could change them. So it was an early form of inner source. I was always a fan of inner source. You know, it shouldn't be a single team running all the templates. Let's open up and have the single team maybe responsive for quality control and have the engineers, because the engineers will move much faster than any central team to empower them to actually create these assets, create these templates, extend things. So that area of another enabling constraint was the fact that you could actually, there was a, a golden pathway. There was a single path to production, which had some constraints. And the, the CDK development kit gave us a way to be opinionated. Like, this is how you should tag your resources. There are some, like, you know, I would say cloud infrastructure standards you need to meet. But once you meet those, you pretty much do whatever you want. So it was an important idea of a, a building block because often we'll think of a new technology, but we don't enable the teams to actually, you know, make use of it. So it was a really important, again, as I say, it was early form of platform engineering. And that's, that's a, a platform engineering, I think is still in its infancy because a lot of people will think of it as the build it and they will come. I will build this thing for the engineers and they will use it. And that never works, you know? So I think we, we, through our experience, we, we knew that, uh, there was a, there was a nice pattern there of the, what's now called the internal developer portal and CDK was our kind of our, our, our language around that. Right, yeah. So to start bringing all of this together, can you talk about what the other things you need to do to enable teams to move as quickly as you were able to? Because it's not purely about the technology. So it's probably there's probably a nice a nice tie into what I'm currently doing now because we're currently I'm with um, um, GP or Globalization Partners now as as, as architects. Uh, I'd say we're a, a scale up, much much smaller than Liberty Mutual. It's like maybe like one and a half thousand people and um, probably 10% the size of the, the teams. But um, we, what we've done is we thought, like, what are the what are the building blocks we need to provide the teams to make it move really quickly? So again, it is, and you're right, it's not about the technology. So some of the things that we, we've, we've put in place is we have a, quite an opinionated um, um, AWS uh, design that we've said, like, it's going to be completely event driven and domain driven. And every workload have, has its own account. There's certain constraints around that, around how you get your account, how you get your environment. So it's a quite opinionated way of how you get your cloud environment. Um, the, the building blocks across the entire organization, we've kind of laid those out to be kind of bounded context in the, in the, in the domain driven design sort of element. So that, um, the, 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 the components of this big system. They want to fit together in a certain way. Uh, we were using a single technology as an eventing backbone, which is event, event bridge. So it's preference with asynchronous communications and synchronous when needed. And then being kind of opinionated on, uh, the technology that we use. So, you know, so giving people a specific set of building blocks and it was able to move very fast. So I would say the, and the key there is using the architecture team as an enablement team. 
So architecture is an enablement team. Uh, we're kind of DevOps team, we're infrastructure team, your cloud engineering there, enablement team, security, our enablement team. And then our, our kind of our, our, our process for helping the teams is the well-architected framework, or we call it SCORP, which is a process that every two weeks will sit with the teams, the individual teams, and work through non-functional um, metrics like performance, security, et cetera, and kind of help the teams. So there's a whole idea of empowerment. So the teams are empowered to build and own their workloads, but we create the right environment that they can actually have the have the, the tools and building blocks that they need. So um, so I, I think the technical decisions that we've made are quite high up in the stack. You know, we, we don't really want teams going going too low down in the stack. So we're, we're actually encouraging Lambda, EventBridge, API Gateway as, as the building blocks and not going kind of too low. And, and that's the way you really want teams to move fast. But I also think there's a piece around explaining that concept to the rest of the organization that there's there's a, there's a different way that we'll build software. Because you're right, a lot of people think that service first is just writing everything in functions. Right. It's actually about thinking about capabilities. You know, another way of it is, is thinking capabilities were features. Someone says, we need a new feature. You say, well, what's the capability that we need? Or we need to bring in vendor X. Well, it's not vendor X, it's a capability. So let's think abstractly about the capability and find the best, the best um, 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 match for that capability. So I think it's a different way of thinking. It's a, it's a hard change because it is a mindset change within the organization. Right. But um, I still, I think you need to kind of create that. And really what we're starting to call this now is modernization. I still think we're struggling for what's the name of this different way of working. And it really is, it's a, the modernization. So what I'm finding now is a lot of companies, they've done their cloud migration. Now that they start their cloud modernization. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's interesting. And do you think, because I think that, you know, that the, the first move to cloud, a lot of that was, you know, containers and orchestrators one way or another. It was yeah. basically Docker and, and Kubernetes or, 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 yeah, it was basically Docker and Kubernetes in the end. Mm. Um, so do you see a move from that approach to serverless? Is that kind of what you're, what you're driving at? I think, I think serverless and the container, I think the serverless world and the container world will start to come together. Yeah. So I think it's really important to say containers are not bad. You know, it's not, it's, it's not a this fresh as that, but it's almost like it's, it's what's in the container. <laughs> if you should talk your monolith and just dropped it in a single container, you know, you've, Still got a monolith in the container, but it's much about you may, it's how you break that up. So what right. I found a lot of companies have basically moved lock stock into the cloud. And now what they've got is they've got a nicer data center that they can't get into. And they've, <laughs> they've, they've had these stand up like observability and processes that now give them better eyes on their, on their software. They can see cost, they can see security, performance. So now they're starting to get eyes. They're starting to measure how the software is performing from a non-functional perspective, uh, at speed of change. And then I think the next natural evolution is start decoupling and breaking up. And that leads you to event-driven or maybe even serverless things. Like a lot of the early work we did was maybe take a piece of something and make that serverless. So you maybe a, a serverless uh, capability with a, a container capability underneath it. So you maybe start to break up the monolith. And again, it's just microservices really. But that's that, and that that's not a. Often the migration is like one move. The modernization could go on for years. Yeah, because you could reimagine your business. There's a whole economy's law with the structure of organization. There will be legacy code. It's a very complex um, kind of nut to crack. There's there's no sort of one and done. Which is why you go back to the idea of the book, which is why this idea of the flywheel effect. You could pick a single purpose, hit it, learn. To do something else with that, it's the evolutionary architecture nature of that. Um, so again, I, I, I'm not going to say containers are bad. I think they're they're. I mean, serverless. It's all containers under the hood. Right. But um, it's the idea of how you think about your your kind of your system design and your architectural approach. I think that's really what that is, and then moving towards a more granular de decoupled approach. That's fantastic, David. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time to chat to me today. Thank you. You really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for listening to this episode of the GoTo Podcast. 
Head over to gotopia.tech to discover lots more content from the brightest minds in software development. Thank you.